I said get me the cheese, the double cheese, the two, two cheese. Oh, it's so difficult to get a good cheeseburger around here. Two, it, food must always be delivered. And how you get it is oftentimes as important as giving it to somebody else. I will, two but two patties. What? Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Campaign Creator Series. My name is Guy and today we are designing Karasujo. Karasujo is Crow Castle. Crow Castle being inspired by the Japanese castle in Matsumoto, which is a beautiful castle. I had the wonderful privilege of going there and um, had a partner who was quite happy to film whilst I was there. So we're going to see some video from that in today's episode, as well as designing the castle. Now we're going to design the castle in today's sponsors software. Today's sponsor being Dungeon Fog, dungeonfog.com. You can go along and use the software for free. Although the version I'm using in today's video is the paid for version. Now, if you use great GM as a code, you will get a discount on your subscription if you choose to get one. They've got all sorts of options coming up in the future. They've just released a whole new map pack, which I'm super excited about. And of course, thankfully, they have a map pack which is inspired by Asia. And that is the map pack we're going to be using in today's video to make our Karasujo, our crow castle. So we're going to jump straight into that and um, let's have a look and see what's coming up next because I've forgotten where I'm in the video. So Matsumoto Castle, the original layout of the castle, is not unique to Japan. What does make it unique was that the castle was built as a defensive castle rather than as a hub. It was also built on a plain. It wasn't built on top of a mountain or on a hill or in a river system. It was built in the middle of a plain. It did become effectively a choke point for anyone trying to move through. Originally it was owned by one faction and once the Edo period started Tokugawa came in, kicked out Toyotami who was in charge of Matsumoto Castle for a long time and uh, replaced him with his own uh, daimyos and 26 daimyos called Matsumoto Castle their home during the Edo period. It flourished and changed and evolved over that period going from being a defensive structure into a commercial hub for that particular part of Japan and as a result it's really easy to get to from Tokyo. There's a direct train line um, as a matter of fact. Very nice train ride. So you can get there easily as a result of the Edo period. Now what was interesting about it as a result of it being on a plane it didn't have a lot of defensive structures so the moat system that was developed was extensive. Almost Almost two separate moats protected the castle, an outer and then an inner moat, which, as you'll see from the videos, they're particularly spectacular in their look and feel. They've been filled in uh, so they're not as deep as they once were. But again, it's about that pageantry, that design ethic, as well as just slowing down the enemy. So there is that. They also had lots of access points. When you're not at war, you don't need to be as defensive. So with two massive castle gates and bridges leading into the castle well you're going to see them just watch the video watch the video it's a freezing morning here in Matsumoto Castle and the tourists are already starting to crowd in it's not difficult to see why what's interesting about this exterior view we're in the outer bailey now of the castle is that's one of the main gate keeps leading into the castle one of two as a matter of fact we're going to look at another one just now but what's interesting is that that's the main gatekeep. Then, just behind me, there's a very small little gap in the wall. That's for boat access. So anyone who's in the moat can actually get into the castle through that. And then finally, this beautiful red bridge, one of three bridges that would actually span the entire length of the moat into the castle. Now these bridges were temporary constructions. In the event of an attack, those bridges would be destroyed then cutting off the castle just to those two gatekeeps. Now what's interesting from a role-playing perspective is that this means our player characters have so many ways to access the castle. They can come in across the bridges, they could come in across the moat, they could come in through that little secret side entrance. There are many, many ways in which they could access this space. And it's something that we have to keep in mind when designing these kinds of things is that history has already shown us how. We just have to remember to look at it. 
Isn't it spectacular? Isn't it just be simply beautiful? Simply, simply beautiful. OK, so now the traps that uh, we very briefly spoke about. We're still on the outer bailey of Matsumoto Castle here. It's winter and I wanted to point out the moat structure. Now, Matsumoto has two moats. Most Japanese castles did. This is the inner moat, the second moat, if you like. It's still massive. It's a major challenge to swim across this. And what they've done, and this is something that I particularly find interesting, is look at all of the bird life. We've got uh, ducks, we've got swans. Those are natural traps. When anybody tries to swim across those, th th these ducks are going to go mad. They're going to fly up into the air. They're going to be very, very dramatic in terms of alerting somebody that there is someone in their moat. There are ice sheets that are starting to form because it's so cold. It's minus one degree Celsius at the moment. Those ice sheets could be deadly slipping traps when trying to cross the moat. However, once the character is across the moat, that's when things start to get interesting. If you can see here, the stonework of these walls, it's 400 years old. This is the original structure, but the stonework is really easy to climb up. It's not difficult at all. So not so difficult to enter the castle, except for the towers right at the top. Those towers have got constant lookouts and they've got windows everywhere, affording a complete 360 degree view of the entire grounds, allowing guards to be constantly vigilant. So we've got these interesting traps which are natural with using the bird life, the wildlife, very interesting approach, as well as then these sentry towers everywhere. What an interesting thing to use natural wildlife as a form of a trap rather than deadly spikes and boulders. Wonderful things history can teach us. I appreciate a designer of, you know, dungeons and castles and other such structures that take into account the delivery bloke, you know? They always, oh, we want a trap full of snakes. Well, how am I supposed to bring the snakes into that dungeon if I can't even get past the first room? Because, you know, there's the giant stripe, spike trap thing which I have to reset every Tuesday. So the real question is, is how does it actually work in terms of those of us that have got to go around and make sure that it works? There's got to be an easier way in than, you know, the main door. So, yeah, you know, any, anything really, just you've got to take that into account. You've got to take into account, we've got to do these things and we can't risk our lives every single time. Yeah, all right, no, we can risk our lives. Sorry, I was picking out a turn. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. No, you know what, it's fine. I, I, that spike trap, I, I can practically walk through in my sleep, actually. You've done it so many times. Yeah, no, all right, don't worry about us, we'll be fine. Ducks and geese, so easy, so easy to create this wonderful ducks and geese. They make an absolutely tremendous noise. Even in South Africa, where I grew up, we used to use geese as watchdogs, far more effective than dogs themselves. Those creatures are incredibly territorial and make the most tremendous furore when someone other than the ones that are allowed enter into their space. And even when those that are allowed enter their space, they can still make a hell of a noise. So it's a very interesting and very simple little trap. Now, now, when we look at it from an elvish perspective, could it be elvish animals? Could there be an elvish swan, some kind of long-lived bird that is particularly beautiful? Perhaps it has gold flecks upon its wings or some kind of elvish local creature I think would work a lot better. It would certainly make it feel as if it's more of an elvish space. So we can certainly incorporate that into the castle design. And of course, then the archers. Now, again, traditionally, elves are all about bows and things. So it makes sense to continue with what Matsumoto was doing. Now, Matsumoto Castle was relatively unique insofar as it really was designed as a defensive choke point. So all of the walls have these access points for bows as well as for firearms. Guns were brought in during the Edo period. And as a result, the castle was upgraded to be able to make use of firearms, which really, of course, 
extended the range and accuracy to a large degree of those defending the castle. Now, when it comes to gatehouses and things like that, you're going to see it becomes even more defensive. But what's also interesting is that it is not influenced by other castles from the rest of the world, but it's curious how other castles from the rest of the world have similar design gates. This is the first moat of Matsumoto Castle. They're all connected, bringing it together as one almost river system, but still a major obstacle to cross. We've got these large collections of ducks again to give us protection, but this is the main gate entrance. Now what makes it interesting is that it's a double gate entrance. It does a dog leg, very similar to the Crusader castles like Crack the Chevaliers. In my hand, I've actually got one of the helmets that would have been worn by the defenders of this castle, originally armed with crossbows and bows, and then later on with firearms. Quite fitting, I would say, as it has the emblazon of the daimyo that would have been in charge of the castle on the front. Always useful to know who you're attacking. Now, as we go in through this gate, the important thing to bear in mind is there's no portcullis here. This is just heavy, heavy, heavy wooden doors allowing entrance or exit into the castle. Now, let's go further into the courtyard and we'll see what makes it interesting is that you're still being fired upon by archers, gunmen from all over the place. And of course they can see out through all of these shots and things. So this is a very interesting design from a control perspective. Players, characters entering into this castle and the gates were open between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. every day. Characters entering into this castle would have to go through this place and you'd have guards checking at this point whether they're allowed into the castle or not. And of course, if they're not, there are people all over the place to make sure that they don't get access. Again, such a remarkable design. Once we then turn our attention away from the mundane, we need to add in the fantastical, otherwise it really is just a historical map. So how do the elves move around? Is it griffins? So we do we need griffin roosts. Certainly the height of Matsumoto would inspire one to say, well, we could add in a pagoda-esque styled building that looks and that functions as a griffin roost or a giant eagle roost or whatever kind of flying creature you want to associate with the elves. If they have magic portals that allow them to step from one place and enter into another place over great distances, we certainly can include that too. That separate tensu, that separate tower, Power of Matsumoto Castle called the Room of the Moon. Um, I've added in the stars in the video, that was actually incorrect. But the Room of the Moon, when we look at that space, well, that could be a portal room without a shadow of a doubt. You're going to see as we're doing layouts, we're going to go through that. And then, of course, what else could we add that makes it uniquely elvish? The moat, for all of its beauty, was also surrounded by cherry blossom trees. So it's just, it, it, it's already, I think, very elvish, very beautiful. Perhaps the color changes. Instead of it being crow-like, perhaps it should be green, make it more in keeping with what we expect from the elves, make it a little bit more natural in terms of its flavoring. But generally speaking, I already see it kind of working across. Maybe I'm too close to this idea. I don't know. But that's my take on it. So I'm not going to go any further in terms of this. We're going to now go into the actual crafting of the castle in Dungeon Fog. And I think you're going to agree the end result is quite, quite beautiful. So when it comes to natural traps, the important thing, of course, to bear in mind, and I think that little brown troll, uh, the little the peasant spoke about it or maybe he was mentioning it in passing. I'm not sure. Nonetheless, or maybe he will mention it. These things get very confusing. Um, nonetheless, having natural defences is, is a brilliant idea and it shows that the builders of this place included the natural geography into the actual structure itself. So there's particularly fine sand in the area. You might make sand traps. In this particular case, it's, it's the ducks and the geese. And the, the real question is how are the average individuals protected by these things? things and within these things and how do they make use of them on a smaller scale you might find that if there's lots of ducks and they're very dangerous or this this elvish swan thing you might find that there are other 
peasants living in the outer areas, in the village around the castle, that will have similar, or aspire to have similar things, so they can appear to be in the same status as those who live in the castle. There will always be some kind of infrastructure around a castle. There's simply too many things that need to be in there. So when you're drawing the map of the castle, bear in mind there will be lots and lots and lots of commoners living outside of the walls of that particular castle to provide services and labour and guards and, and the like. Oftentimes castles are drawn in isolation in fantasy worlds and it's very unlikely that that would actually happen unless you're going to be you know, carting in all your workforce every day from a village that's way too far away to be protected in a surprise attack type of situation. It's very important to bear in mind that as a villager, you want to be as close to, if not inside the castle, as possible, because if you are under sudden attack, you don't want a three-hour walk to get to the place of defence. <clears throat> I, I don't know. Is, is it, I think the centurion was going to talk about that. He sent some notes. I, I hope that's all right. Right, so here we are in Dungeon Fog. This is my dashboard, and I'm going to be showing you how to do Matsumoto Castle. Bearing in mind that I do have a full subscription to Dungeon Fog, you can pick up a subscription yourself. If uh, you do so, use the code GREATGM, and you will get a discount on a yearly subscription. They have also switched over to a monthly model, where you can pick up Dungeon Fog on a monthly basis. So you can make all of your maps in one month, and then uh, make sure that you're not paying for the rest of the year, if you so choose. Anyway, we're going to make uh, Matsumoto Castle, or Karasujo, uh, uh, Matsumoto. And uh, we're going to be making the central courtyard, the keep, and the moat around that. So we're going to go through that a little bit. Uh, so this is a Japanese castle. And I'm just going to go through and sort all of this out before we get started. Always useful to do this. I always work at 100 pixels, that's just for me personally. I'm going to go 25 by 25, it's quite a big map in comparison to uh, regular Dungeon Fog maps, but we're going to need it to do that. So here we have our blank canvas, thank you very much, looking very good, very nice. And we're going to go in now and we're going to add a blueprint. So we want to be able to trace out the shape of Matsumoto Castle rather than having to refer to it, and there's a very specific reason for that. A lot of castles that we will look at in the course of our gaming lives were built based on the geography. Now, I've spoken about geography before, where you kind of outlined uh, hills and things in Dungeon Fog and then went from there. We're going to do something where we use the actual blueprint. So I've got Matsumoto. I've got an aerial uh, image here of Matsumoto Castle. There you can see it with that wonderful starting of the double moat. Now, there's actually another moat, a second major moat, all independent from, from these ones, that was even further out with an even further retaining wall beyond that. Now, that's beyond our scope for today. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our zoom values here um, well, we can zoom in and zoom out so we can see the actual castle. We're only interested in the central piece, in the in the primary castle, in the Tenshu, as they would call it, as well as the first outer bailey, if you like. The second outer bailey is, is, is not what we are focusing on at the moment. So we want to, to now try and um, make this fit a little bit better. If we so choose, we can hold the control button down and we can scroll with it. Now, as I use my scroll wheel, you can see that grid getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That's because the map itself is effectively being made bigger and bigger and bigger. Then I can drag the map around and you'll see that it's dragging it around inside that grid. So as I said, we don't want this outer bailey nonsense. We just want the actual island itself with the first moat because that's what we feel we're going to need for our campaign. So I can really zoom in there quite a lot and get to a point where effectively we've got just the beginnings let's go the other way just the beginnings of that little uh, of the of the land the other side of the moat if you like i'm happy with that i'm going to hit on the ply and now we can see that it's there now if i if i show the grid um I mean, let me actually get rid of the grid first. So if I if I hide the stage, it becomes a lot more transparent. It becomes a lot easier to see what's going on. And of course, the grid itself, we can just change the opacity of the grid all the way down. We do need to keep that grid uh, grid on. And I'm going to tell you why in a little bit, even though we're going to be working contrary to that, which I think is quite exciting. So that's something to bear in mind. Now, 
Here's where it starts to get complicated. There are a couple of ways that we could go about building this map. There are many ways that we could. There are some ways that I have already tried, as a matter of fact, and failed to achieve. And it's got to do with how uh, Dungeon Fog works within the parameters of your browser. Now, I use Chrome. I've, I've been with Chrome since it came out. It's a very resource intensive monster nowadays it changed from what it used to be but also it has a certain limitation on its OpenGL um, usage and it will eventually crash within dungeon fog if you get to too many assets it's trying to draw all of that stuff and it gets to a certain point chrome actually shuts it down chrome breaks everything and causes it to stop working Firefox is apparently a lot better at handling that, and I don't know how the other um, browsers handle that. So that's something to, to look at and jump onto the Dungeon Fog Discord to go and find out more about that. So, all right, the way we're going to do it, the most efficient way, the most efficient usage, I would say, of, of the Dungeon Fog process is to build all of these things as rooms. So this courtyard is actually going to be a room. We're not going to build it in, in any other kind of way. Now, as we zoom in, you can see that they're those three Tenshu. Now, Tenshu basically means tower. So the, officially, this whole thing is a castle. We would call this traditionally a keep. These are called Tenshu in Japanese. So we're going to kind of stick with that. Now, we have converted these to elvish uh, Japanese kind of things. How are those going to interfere or affect our design? Well, we'll have a look at that in a little bit. But for now, we need to actually just design this entire structure. So what I've done to make our lives a little bit easier is that by choosing a floor that looks like a rooftop, it's going to really help us in terms of our design. So that would be perhaps we could go to roofs here and um, just make sure, and unlike me who always changes the colors and things, that you are working with the basic color. We want to see that. Let's make our size back up to 100%. So we can kind of get a sense of what that floor is going to look like. Let's work with these. Now these roof shingles, these are the ones that are used throughout um, most of the props within Dungeon Fox. So we're actually going to work with that. And the walls, the walls we're going to make invisible for the tent shoe anyway. So we're going to come in here and we're going to make these. I'm going to leave them at one so you can see what's going to happen. All right, so we're going to plot out. Now, do you notice how the grid doesn't fit with particularly with any point in the castle? That's not a problem. We're going to hold down shift and that allows us to then design these shapes. So I'm going to draw this castle here. Now obviously the photograph has got to all those wonderful photographic errors of parallax and the like closer, you know, things that are closer to the camera bend a little bit less or more depending. All right, so oh, that didn't work. I don't know why. Oh, because of the shift. Now you have to be very careful when you are using the shift key that you do hit the exact point. Now I don't have to be too specific. I don't have to be too accurate. I've actually let go of the shift key so that I can then get that going on. All right, now that that's given us a roof space. Now that doesn't look particularly roof-like. It kind of it, it it sort of does, but the roof the shingles wouldn't do that. So. Firstly, I'm going to change these to zero so you can have a look and see what happens when we change it to zero. Notice now we don't have those walls around the roof. <clears throat> it still hasn't made it look more roof-like, but that's not the point. We're going to come back to these in a little bit, so you're going to see how we're going to do that. So we're going to carry on um, just plotting out. Now, this one is on point, which is quite nice. Now, notice that orange line. It's always going to want to, to link back um, to the shapes that are already in existence. I don't have to hold down shift in order for it to do that. Again, we get that sort of beveling edge of the fake walls, which we, we now know where they come from. Now, down here, I have the advantage of actually having been to this castle. So I can tell you that when they built it, they built it with this funny little extra bit sticking out here. And this actually is where the stairs are to get out of the primary uh, castle itself they've got it as a little bit skewed there so we're going to come in there and just just make these shapes now I can actually just go underneath this roof because ultimately that's what's going to happen we're going to rearrange these later on and I don't mind that the shape is not even and this is what I was talking about before if we look at say these walls they don't run parallel with these walls they didn't have that requirement that wasn't a, a, a need when they were building the castle so if we want our castles to look real we're going to avoid those very square shapes unless you're doing something like the Romans but even then they still had to follow geography it was, a, it was an economy um of of building basically that's 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 pretty much what it was now the only other major buildings on this particular map is um the gate here uh the gatehouse which we need to drop in gatehouse was a very simple very very simple based structure so we're gonna 
build that in one. Again, notice the diagonal is what makes it an interesting space. I'm going to come back and, and erase all of these um, strange uh, points and, and, and sort of square it up a little bit. Then there was this um, this building here. Now, this building in today era, modern era, is actually the giant curio shop, which is a very well stocked curio shop, very nice one. And so we're going to drop that in there. Those are guard towers. We've got a special, we're lucky um, Dungeon Fog has given us some assets for that, so we don't have to go in and make that. Then down here, there's some structures, and this is where that little pedestrian footpath was. So there are going to be some gatehouses there. Then there are these little structures. Now, some of these are, are built on the original foundations, but not a lot of them are. So we're going to come in there, and we're just going to do this again. We're going to make a, a little shape here. Now, once we've got the basic shape in, we will then go crazy and come in and redesign everything. But the, the bottom line is we want to try and start off by being accurate. Control and scroll to zoom out. We're not going to put in any other structures in here. And then this gate was added in later. This wasn't actually part of the original castle design. It was added in as a security feature so that you had a fire escape in case this particular part burnt down. This is a wooden part down here, if you can see where my cursor is. So there we are. Those are the primary buildings. Now, these buildings here... These buildings are, are, they were added on much, much, much later on because the central area here, this is all, as a matter of fact, this was all the actual residencies of the, 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 the lords and the ladies. They didn't actually stay in the actual castle itself. The castle was purely designed for defense and had a secret level. Everyone thought it was only five stories high. When you actually get into the castle, it's six stories high. They were sneak, very sneakily used perspective and things to change it so that it doesn't look like there's a, a middle story, which is where the lords and ladies would hide uh, or retreat to to tactically control the battle from. So we can now look at this and say, okay, let's go in and add in the lords um rooms and things so we can start to get an idea of how we're going to finish off this castle um and now we're building it at this scale because sometimes you just need this kind of scale now a lot of the times these these pathways and things were built on the original pathways now this castle's got a very long history which i won't go into but basically down here was where the falcons and things were kept which i think is a lovely idea and then this was the actual living living space now you did come in on a main path and then it did do a right angle turn to get into the castle so if we figure it out now these green areas these are where the the foundations you can actually see it there very faintly the foundations were for the lord's as I said, the Lord's Palace, uh, where they actually remained. But because those structures were built out of wood and paper, as we know, um, they didn't last very long. So I'm going to basically just sort of follow these older paths, making these these rooms, saying, OK, well, if that's the Lord's main room, there would have been an entertaining room. You always need, and this is something that a lot of people forget about, is that you always need some some means of feeding everybody and those that requires kitchens and the kitchens require servants and that sort of thing so I, I will come and square these up later on don't don't panic now having watched a lot of japanese movies one discovers that the basic layout is that there's a pitched roof and then there's a sort of a a, a porch or a veranda as, as we would call it that runs around the entire circumference of it allowing guards to sort of patrol and and, and the like so we're going to do that we're going to come over here and I would say that there would be a reciprocal structure, if you like, perhaps for the um, barracks of the men, although that might be a little too close to the lords and ladies who are sleeping and dining here. I would um, say that this little pathway here probably was added in when they were restoring the castle rather than actually operating during the castle, although maybe it's the other way around. Maybe this road came in here and actually was was disastrous in terms of changing the flow so let's do that let's run on that basic idea we've got a wall over there which we will be coming to in a little bit so let's let's use that path as the crazy path and let's close this up we'll, we'll figure out what these are later on when we get there and these rooms don't have to be to scale i mean these little rooftops and things that we're putting in there's gonna be a tower over there so Let's try and be cognizant of that. There was no exit there. So let's put in something here, which I think the Lords the lords might have. Now, I mentioned briefly beforehand about the stables, which were outside. Yes, there would have absolutely been stables outside. 
without a, a, a doubt, but perhaps in here there might be a little training yard for, for the king or the, the lord's princesses. Now, this is something that I like to do when I'm building these kinds of things, is to say, well, the lord who lived here would have had a wife that would have been prescribed or possibly arranged before the lord even became a lord, or, you know, all of these wonderful um, prearranged marriages and things. And she would have had some kind of impact. Now, whether that was a positive impact or a negative impact, it doesn't really matter. There was going to be, there would be an impact. And I think that we have to take into account what those impacts might be. Now, we only have to look at uh, the White House, for example, to get a sense of what those impacts are. Traditionally, the First Lady is responsible for decorating certain parts of the White House. And they go in and they can try and change things and, and leave their own, their own identity, if you like, in terms of, of designing spaces. I would assume a very similar thing would happen in this case. So we have our defensive structure, then we've got all of our palaces and things. And this area here was devoted, whilst we were there anyway, to the crops that would have been grown and how they were grown during that period. That means, as far as I'm concerned, those wouldn't be there to, in, in this period when we're busy redesigning this castle. So I'm going to actually erase that by dropping in. Again, we're going to follow this footpath because I think it's quite fun. Now, um, yes, I'm going to erase this field, but with what? Well, this section here, this funny little section here of of wall, alongside here, there's actually steps going up to a, a little jetty, which would allow people to sail in and out. So I think we're going to have a big guard tower here on the edge of this. So this area here, I think, this is quite possibly where our kitchens could be. So this is where supplies are brought in, and... If you think about it, load up supplies on a wagon, come through this double gate and all the way down here, or load up supplies here and just sail across directly to the kitchens. That's far more efficient. The food is more likely to be, you know, remain uh, in good condition and that sort of thing. Or the princess comes along here and she can get into the castle directly. And so the, the, I think putting the kitchens here makes kind of sense. So kitchens are here, then you'd have a main main dining area here. Uh, this could be some sort of staff thing. Kitchens will need supplies. Now, we know that they did have some supplies in the castle itself in case of sieges. This castle was designed for a military siege, so we're going to drop that in here. Now, I'm building very square, but that's also the Japanese tended to build fairly square or L shapes and things because of the way that their roofing worked. We're going to come to that in in just a little bit now we've got this funny shape here again this castle this is off angle so i'm gonna i'm gonna be inspired by that i'm gonna say right let's go off angle oh dear uh it's quite tricky to go off angle so we will come back and and fix it out as we need to so there's another building we'll fix that up um not sure exactly what that one's for we'll get there we'll get there uh we'll drop one in there then over here these are the kitchens I don't think the kitchens need a little courtyard in front of them. I think that would be very strange. Um, so perhaps what we do is over here, we put in a building, which will cause the servers no end of grief. I'll have to run around to get into the main eating areas, but that's fine. They're only servants, after all. We don't have to worry about them too much. And then just put in another building here, just to give us a sense of the structures of the space. And then we do need one here because it would accommodate for why why there was this strange strange shape now something else that we also need to think about when we are designing these is how are our players going to get in and out now we've, we've seen on the videos and things that there's all kinds of of horrendous wildlife lurking about in the moats ducks and swans and, and other hideous monsters like that things that are truly truly terrifying and um so we need to take those into account and, and, and figure out, well, <clears throat> where are they bred? Where are they kept? What what sort of happens to them? Um, but for now, I think that's... Oh, we've got this big space over here. So because of the elvish angle, there was a bit of a garden that had been installed here. So I think we should, we should, we should honor that by keeping this open as a little garden. But then a garden requires a garden, you know, keeper... And they need somewhere to live, so I'm going to drop them. I'm going to drop them in here. And there's another funny little shaped building, and just see what they see what they say in terms of living there. This side of the castle we know is very defensive, so let's put the barracks in here. Why not? Then that puts them far enough away from the lords and the ladies that they won't have to hear the rabble rousers. 
as they go about their rebel rousing, um, being all godlike and 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 that sort of thing. And we're going to do the same thing over here. Again, we'll we'll fix these bizarre shapes. But that I think is a pretty interesting layout for a castle. Now, of course, we've still got to go in and we've got to do the actual walls themselves. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and there's not much to talk about when it comes to placing down the walls, except that we're going to do the exact opposite effect. So here, where we built the roofs without walls, uh, or will, once I have gone through it, and I realize now I should have done that way before, but I'm recording a video, so the brain is not working very well. So instead of now having to go to each and every single one of these and changing these to zero, which is awfully tedious, I'll do this whilst uh, you're not listening. Right, so now that we've fixed that problem, we're now going to make the actual walls themselves of this particular particular structure. And there were a couple of ways that we could have done it, and they were all wrong. And there are a couple of ways that we can do it, which are all right. So the right way to do it is to actually build this entire thing as a room. Now, um, why not just make the wall a freestanding wall that runs all the way around? Well, again, it's about the efficiency and the um, the way in which that dungeon fog works. So by creating it as a single room, we then start to get contents of rooms rather than contents of levels, which allows us to effectively hide rooms as we no longer need them, which from a usage point of view hides them. At least that's how I understand it. So we're going to go off and do that quickly. Remember to save periodically every now and again. Dungeon Fog does save locally as well as, as um, on the net. So there is that to, to bear in mind. We're going to change our material now. We're going to go to natural stone. Again, the, 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 the stonework was always very, very white. So I'm going to leave it with these values, minus 70, 24, and 0. So it's a very white wall. And uh, we can change the inside to, to being white as well. But you're going to realize we're not actually going to use it. Um, it really doesn't matter what it is. Just in case we do see it, though, knock out that... Um, saturation then we get that sort of wonderful effect right so let's go around we're going to make this into one gigantic room and uh i've got to click on the actual thing that you want to actually use i think it's changed one of the rooms now to looking like that yes it has i'll go back and change that later on okay so let's start we're going to hold down shift because again we're working on uneven surfaces we're going to start here and just work our way around the castle as we need to. Uh, again, not too phased by following the lines specifically, because we are going to come back and change this as we need to. But we need to have this outer wall happening. We need to get this shape going. Now, I'm actually going to cut across here. And this is going to be another room. Again, it's just about that, that uh, maximizing our... Uh, efficiency here in terms of of what's happening and following all these wonderful wonderful strange lines that we get this very human and i know we're using elves but it's a very very much more natural shape than we might have got beforehand okay so there we go uh that's looking pretty good now the floor i said didn't really matter as to what it's going to be because we're going to change that up but the walls do matter. So we're going to change those outer wall thickness, let's say, to... Let's make it 12, actually. Um, oh, did I... No, I didn't select the room. So we're going to make that 12. And that's really thickened it up. Maybe that's too thick given our scale. Let's drop it down to 8. If we make the inner wall, it's just going to make it a smaller circumference, basically. So so that's not particularly what, we, what we're looking for. Now, we need to go to our stack here. And we go to... Not to our levels. We go to our stage... And there you can see all of the different rooms and things highlighting underneath this main room. Now, this is the main room. We're going to call this the walls. So when I take this and drag it all the way down to the bottom down there, there we go. Now all of our roofs have popped up. Now, it's still a little bit confusing because we are seeing the map overlaid on top of everything. So when we zoom out, we kind of go, well, it sort of looks roughly like what we think it's supposed to look like. But if we hide this map, suddenly we see, oh, now it's a lot more obvious as to what's going on. And that's really, really, really useful. 
um, to be able to come back and, and you look at that and you go, well, that's actually a pretty organic looking shaped castle. That's not too bad. If I had drawn this myself, I might have been tempted to just run straight down these lines and I certainly wouldn't have had these weird angled shapes. So if ever you want to improve your castle design, this is the way to go about it. In my opinion, it really does work. We get this quite nice organic feel to the way that the buildings were put up. You kind of get a sense that the Lord went, whoa, we need to put the kitchen up. All right, well, we'll put it over here. And oh, we need some more barracks because we've got more guards. So that's really, 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 really useful, in, in my opinion. Okay, so now we've got this wonderful room. Sorry, that's me adjusting in my chair. Uh, we've got this room happening. I'm going to go and restore this wall, this roof, very, very quickly because um, foolishly I uh, changed it without thinking. So that's now that's now put back. So we can now start working out, okay, how are we going to do these roads? And there's a couple of methods that we can use for that. We can actually use just use the brush tool, which is most likely what I'm going to use. We can build in the second room. We definitely need to do that. We need to build a second room. Why did I build it separately from here? Because it actually is separate. The the actual actual um, substrate, when you look here, the wall's a little bit thinner. It's more of a, a protective outer, outer wall. It's not actually part of the main castle. So I really wanted to get that feel. And the only way to really do that, and again, this bizarre shape, this truly bizarre shape, so now we can do that, and I can come here and say, well, actually, the wall thickness is only going to be six. So we can definitely see that there's a different shape here. This wall is still sitting above this one because, again, in our stack, uh, when we go to the stage, we see here that this one, which we can now call gate wall, it's always useful to label these things, gate wall, we're now going to drag all the way down to being just above regular walls. So that when we then reveal it, we see that our roof is still sitting on top. And we, there are a couple of reasons for that later on. Okay, so let's do something that's irritating me now. We can come in and we can change our, our ground. Um, and I think we want some sort of gravel in there. Let's let's put some, some gravel in. The scaling now is too big. Notice, I mean, we're not working in 10, we're working in tens of feet here. We're not working anything else. The scaling is too big for that. So we can drop this down to, let's say, 50%. Let's have a look. That doesn't look too bad to me. We're at 70% zoom in, so always oops, click on the map first, then zoom in, otherwise you will be chroming uh, it in. So that's still a bit too repetitive. So let's go down to, say, 30%. There we go. That's looking a little bit better. We're not seeing too much of that pattern happening. Um, if we offset it by an odd angle, that can help too in terms of breaking things, in terms of breaking the uniform shape. Now, we'll come to these outer layers later on when we need to. Okay, so this inner bailey, now it could be gravel, it could be gravel, but I don't think it would be. I think quite possibly it would be grass of some kind. Um, maybe sea grass could work. It's a bit more obvious, but again, at this scale though, maybe that's the wrong way to go. So let's go and have a look at um, our, our uh, ground cover that we have a choice of. And I have gone completely blank. I think it is under wood. Is it under wood? No, it's not under wood. Why would it be under wood? Why have I gone blank? Where is ground cover? Nature. There we go. Grass. So we can then choose a grass that we think is, is most appropriate to this um, space. It might help us if we come and um, deselect the room and turn off the, the blueprint. So we can see what sort of effect is happening in there for that grass. It's not terrible. I'm not unhappy with that. Just making it a little bit smaller. Playing around with the, the layering, the texturing, just until we get something that we're happy with that's too green. That might work. Prairie grass could work. Long grass, I think, might might be the best option. Dirt with scarce patches of grass. Too repetitive a pattern. I like it when you can't really see the pattern too much. There's some techniques that we can do. I think this long grass is, is working, definitely working for me. We could darken it down a little bit so that it doesn't feel so so bright by just changing that. I think that 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 that's a keeper. That's a winner uh, right there. We're at 100% zoom in. Um, of course, let's let's try 80%. What does that look like? Oh, I could live with 80% too. It definitely gives us that grassy feel. We then want to put in our roads and things. We're going to come and do that as well. So many things to do. It's wonderful. 
it really keeps you um keeps you on your toes in terms of what we need to do let's bring back that blueprint now and the reason why we're going to do that is because we're going to use it to do our roads now our roads we can choose whatever we like i'm going to go with gravel because that's what it is currently it's gravel and i don't see why they would change that necessarily and there's some wonderful gravel options we have here now uh, this gravel works right well rocks with small stones scaled to a much smaller value than that i think 60 percent might very well work for us now our opacity is where it becomes important so what i like to do is about an opacity of 60 with a big thickness and a softness on the brush so that when we come here we can see that it's okay so that's too big in terms of its thickness let's drop that down a little bit um so that's about right for our main roads and let's drop that down a little bit so that looks about right okay so then i like to just draw and we're going to draw that in and already we can see definitely the wrong size but we're going to cut we're going to fix that so there's the pathway in there there's that dog leg that we talked about in the previous video and then we're going to come down here and go this way through that round there oh dear and into the courtyard which uh, we will draw like that the road goes off in that direction now why didn't it draw that um oh i know why all right fine so we're going to do that come in there come in there and through to there okay so we can see it's starting to form up um there's a main road here which we want to pathway down of course and join up through there this building is in the wrong way isn't it it's in the wrong place so grab the building grab the corner and move it over because it was blocking our road so there we go and still in our brush tech texture we then can come in here now i'm not changing that size even though the pathway is of a certain size and you're going to see why in a little bit come that back that way let's connect these two and then they do have to go down to that footbridge because the footbridge was quite nice all right for now i think that pretty oh wait hang on a moment and then we need the um little entrance way to the harbor which is down there okay i'm not doing really anything all right now what i have specifically done is kept the opacity slightly slightly low so i can now come back here select get rid of that so we can now see our pathway but if i zoom in on that pathway you'll see that there is a certain amount of transparency very specifically chosen and we could probably actually drop that down even more so that we get this sort of feathering effect happening now, uh, again, this is what I like, is that we can retroactively come back and say, no, it's too thick, it's too thick, it's too thick. Um, and then we can increase our, our, our softness around that. Or we could say we want it thicker, actually, uh, with less softness or with more softness. Now, I usually go with a little bit more softness. And you're going to see now why. Now, this is too big, so we have to change this down. Let's say 50%. Yes, 50% to me looks about right. So I'm just going to go through here and go 50%. There are a couple of ways that we can select our paths as we as we so choose we could select each one we could go into the stack and choose from there as well we're not going to do either of those things at the moment we're going to just persevere as uh, we get to making these all the right size um hopefully hopefully the right size now i think this room has actually got a brush inside of it yes it does Okay, so we go into the room, and here we'll go with the stack because it shows us the actual brush. We can select the brush. Uh, is that showing us this brush? No, I don't know why it's doing that. That's very strange. Uh, are we in this room? Yes, unnamed brush. Here we go. And um, what am I trying to do? We just want to delete that. So there we go. The brush is gone. That was the one that I said disappeared very strangely because it was actually stuck inside the building, not actually inside this building. We wanted it there, not 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 here okay and um, working through again you can see that stack so we could actually just work through them this way if we wanted to and just sort of select each one and then go in and, and change each one as we needed to um if we if we were so inclined it's, it depends on you and how you want to to navigate your map what do you think is faster uh, is is basically what it boils down to and i i almost like to click i the more familiar you are with the map the better i don't think it's ever ever a bad thing for you to remember having to go and change 500 roads because they didn't fit properly um because you forgot to press button now here is the reason why i do this this pathway thing it's because when i come back and do a second pass 
with the the um, brush. And I do a second pass with the brush, and that's generally um, one of the reasons why having rooms is so much better. So do you notice how we've got different types of gravel? And for me, when we're looking at, at making these roads look as if they work, this is probably what the gravel should look like when it's laid down absolutely fresh. But it's never laid down absolutely fresh. Well, it is, and then it's, it's no longer. So I'm going to be doing that again by going over it with a second brush. So you get this wonderful mix, and we can make this second brush a little bit darker, actually. Let's make it a little bit darker. We'll increase the saturation a bit, so it's a bit of a richer color. And then we can come in here, and I'm going to zoom out so I can I can do a, a nice long path. The less brush strokes you have to make, the better. So let's start here. I'm going to follow it along the pathway, and do you see how automatically we're getting we're getting this lovely effect that's starting to happen? Okay, whereby we can see that there's not just one layer to these paths, but multiple multiple sort of layers and it's just going to make this pathway feel a little bit better a little bit richer a little bit nicer and we can come back and change it and tweak it as much as we like ad infinitum uh, if we so if we so choose now again these pathways in between here i'm going to change the thickness of the brush i am actually going to change the thickness this time and probably just run if i were a worker i'd run from here i'd run back here and around to there as a shortcut and this is probably a shortcut in here and uh, there's definitely a shortcut across there, even though you're not allowed to take it. Probably a shortcut around here to the back of this building because, well, you're arriving by boat, and so you want to do that sort of thing. Um, definitely there will be a patrol line around the entire length of these walls. So we need to go in and do that. And I'm going to try and do that in one brush. So I'm going to zoom all the way out. Start here and just walk around. dum -da dum -da dum -da dum our castle. Again, the important thing here is that this is a room that we're working in, so we can turn this room off later on when we want to check for certain things and, 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 and the like. Alright, there we go. So we've walked all the way around our castle. We've created that nice little pathway, as you can see. And so, again, that allows us to come back here and say, well, do this pathway here, do we want a little bit more of that underneath or a little bit a little bit less? You know, we can we can really change it up. And I I find that that also helps with with um making the texture not so apparent, not so obvious that uh, we've we've we we're repeating the pattern so 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 many times. Um so that's just something that's just something that I do, and, and, and you can use it or not use it. It's up to you. So we'll do something like that. Um, and then the outer one, we can feather a bit more. Again, if I was to actually just get to the right layer, um, we can make it broader if we wanted to, so it feels more sort of broken up or, or narrower. Probably should have done it the other way around, as a matter of fact. So we are in this room. Where is that? brush underneath. So this is the brush underneath. If I now change this texture, we can make it very dark. So it's a bit more like that. Increase the uh, coloration a little bit. Make it thicker. Uh, make it thinner. Does that look more like a road or less like a road? I don't know. Um, anyway, the, the, the choice is yours to then literally go in and play as you so choose to to design your roads and, and that sort of thing. But it gives it a very nice look, I think. And so so there you are. We're going to use the same technique later on to actually dirty up the grass. Now, something that a lot of you might be looking at is going, well, these roofs don't look particularly exciting. And they absolutely are not, because they were simply designed to give us rooms. So each of these little rooms we now can play with and do with as we so choose. And that is exactly what we're going to start doing. Before we get there, though, we want to start putting in some props, and we want to save, of course. And the props we're going to be using is the Far East. Now, again, you need to be a subscriber in order to access these props. So if you are using Dungeon Fog and you can't see them, well, this is why um, you're not you're not subscribed. So we're going to go to Outdoor, and what they've done... Um, was it an outdoor? Yes, it was. Uh, so in Outdoor, they've given us these wonderful, wonderful towers, which we're going to shrink down to about the size we want. So I think each block here is about 20 foot, to be perfectly honest with you. So this is a, um, yeah, about 20 feet wide would probably make the most sense. So we probably have to thicken up these walls, actually, if that's 20 foot per, per block. 
and so then the towers will sit on the corners now notice what happens when i place the tower it falls off and there's a reason for that this is a room and the way that dungeon fog works is of course the rooms are independent of one another if i do it on the outside it won't show us on the inside so what we have to do is we need to decide on the placement of our towers i'm actually going to shrink them down a little bit more let's say each block is actually Mm, more along the lines of let's say if that's a 40 by 40 foot or 20 by 20 foot room then each block would probably be closer to say 30 foot square so then i can drop this tower on here and we can decide how we want to position it i actually find positioning them slightly off angle like that creates quite an interesting shape now notice it has disappeared so i'm going to select this prop i'm just going to click on over here and i'm going to say above the walls and now suddenly it's above the walls and our walls are starting to look great now again we want to change the thickness of these walls we said eight was too thick well we said 12 was too thick but i think we actually go to like 16 in order for these walls to actually be on scale with the rest of the structures so now we can come in and adjust this as we as we so choose again though the interesting thing about this room is that we now have the tower that we can now turn on and off and group and uh, we certainly will be doing that as we need to so i'm going to create a folder here and i'm going to call this folder towers towers and i'm actually going to put the tower in there and we're going to stay in here whilst we're placing more props down so that we get the sense of um space and i think the props were at 35 percent no they're a little bit smaller actually they were at 25 percent if unless i'm greatly mistaken if i hold down shift and scroll it uh changes the positioning of the tower now there's that little gate entrance in here but it was a pedestrian entrance so i'm actually going to have it um not running not running through a tower but on either side of a tower so i'm going to put a tower there and i'm going to put a tower here again notice how this one's fallen out now this one is actually no longer considered part of this building where we've got our content and we've got our our, our um roof towers that we can drop into the actual folder this is no longer considered that it's part of this outside space so i'm going to grab it and if my cursor is on the outside i can move it around and it's going to remain on the outside but if my cursor if i left click and grab it on this inside and i let go it's now registered on the inside and there it is under my tower's roof so that's something that's very important to bear in mind is that depending on where you want these things placed you need to keep your cursor in the right place otherwise it will register it as being somewhere else that's very very important uh, to bear in mind we're going to drop this in here let's grab the little symbol in you go in here we're going to go through each one and just make sure that they are above the walls because otherwise they will hide underneath them and we don't want that at all uh, so you're above the walls you're above the walls okay great stuff i have no idea why it's not showing them as above the walls now That was an interesting little glitch so there we go now also because these are walls we can drag this one i'm just going to just drag this one I'm going to move them over a little bit so we can put in a doorway there now i don't know how big these doors are we go with fantasy door and possibly with it's going to be a closed one because this archway would be closed so there we are and we can actually drop it in like that and it will appear as if it is a gateway now we can put a little bridge running out from underneath that and everything will be absolutely fine thank you very much and uh, we can we can do that right now so we don't forget about it and we don't have to worry again we're going to be going to the far east and again we've got this wonderful bridge option coming in here this is too big it was meant to be a little footpath that was leading into the castle i'm just going to do one there and then flip it around so we layer it on top of this one so we get the little pathway on either side there's our bridge and that's it that's it we're done with that so back to putting towers into place oops uh 25 for our tower zoom we can put some broken tiles or towers in if we so choose but i don't see the elves as being particularly careless when it comes to maintenance i'm going to leave these red stripes as edging on the castle i think they're banners they're originally meant to be banners hanging down i'm going to drop one in here 
and we'll come back to the um, overlay later on and we're going to drop one in there I'm going to put that at an angle again because the rest of the castle's got some interesting angles I don't see why the towers would be placed at, at regular uh, regular angles either so we're going to put this one say here we, we, we always come back and, and reassess later on and then this one will sort of drop in I would say probably there which means that this building I'll come back to it will need to move and then there's definitely going to be a tower watching over this main entrance gate coming in here now this is a shorthand in terms of building these towers um, but I don't think that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I think that you've got to, you've got to make the most of um, your time. And in this particular instance, where we are building a particularly large castle, I think anything that's going to save you time is going to be of value. So that's, that's, that's my thinking on that. That is the harbour entrance. It's actually in there with steps going up. So I'm going to put another tower here. Um, and we've got this great big castle that's looking over this area, but we'll do a tower in there. We'll come and move it in a little bit later on, and I think that's it. So let's pull out a little bit and see. I think there's a bit of a gap here, my lord. So let's drop in the Queen's Tower. Call it the Queen's Tower because it makes her feel happy. And there we go. So let's just go through these and put them above. And above, and you can see now they're popping out quite easily above again this this structure it's really caused us some problems hasn't it it's, anyway it's all sorted now and these towers are in this room which is again just that management that we were talking about it's been going for what uh, about an uh, 47 minutes or so and already we've got quite a good looking castle map not not yet at the level that we wanted to be so we're gonna we're gonna keep on working now I can come in this one always felt a little bit like it was too far away. We want that sort of red bar to be the center of the 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 the, the tower. So we got to sort of move it around a little bit. Again, making sure my cursor doesn't overreach, doesn't go into the next building, as it were, the next the next space, which is out here. We don't want that to happen. This one now feels like it should be turned that way, so that they're sort of looking there and they're sort of looking a little bit there. I think that that makes the most sense. These have to be parallel to each other because they are gate gate entrances. So we'll do that. That's fine. That's fine. Don't have a problem with that. This one's looking a bit weird out here. Let's pull that one back a bit. That's fine. And I'm, I'm quite happy that the wall changes direction underneath the tower. I think that that's what they would do is they'd build up to those towers and then and then go from there. It's a bit clustered down here with all of these gate keeps and towers and things, but it kind of needs to be, because that is a, a major axis. Now these bridges are designed to be burnt down later on, so that's quite useful to bear in mind. I'm going to come in here, and now we were talking about changing the shape and, and that sort of thing. As long as you can access your structures, you're okay. So we're gonna we're gonna do this now. There's no this is not a city. We're not designing a, a a city here. So it really is about saying okay, well this is probably the shape it would take. Now I know I'm squaring up stuff, and I know that that's awful because we said we weren't going to do that. So I I will try and avoid squaring up things. But it does make sense to sort of have that that layout there. And the other thing to bear in mind is that just because this has got a slate roof those beautiful blue tiles that uh, the Japanese use on on all of their structures doesn't mean that the rest needs to have that they probably would though so that is something to bear in mind and let's just bring that in there so it's a little bit uh, more on point looking a little bit better there okay so we've we've got a very good foundation for our for our castle and there's enough in there in my thinking to keep it still looking organic what's next well what's next is to save and then to put in some roofs now I'm going to be quiet during this period so I can fast forward for you so you don't have to go through this process because it's quite a painful quite a painful process but effectively what we're going to do is let's let's choose this little structure here for example we're going to zoom in now because it is a room again we've got it as an unnamed room we could name it if we if we really wanted to uh, let's just find it here we go so it's this room here no come on it's this room here and let's call this um, let's call this the falconry 
Okay, so we, we now have a, a little a memory that this falconry room has, has got that. If we go into the prop section, we have these wonderful roofs that they've made, and notice that they use the same roof tile. So if I were to plonk this down, watch, watch, watch what's going to happen. The edges fall off because we're inside a room. So in order for us to get really the maximum effect of this wonderful prop piece, we're going to line these things up. We're working at 135% zoom here. Um, so we must bear that in mind and so there we go now of course I come back to the room and I say above the walls and bingo it sticks above the walls now because we made the actual room itself this is the, the particularly interesting part because we made the room itself an actual room we can come in here and we can actually adjust it underneath the roof piece so that it doesn't stick out as much as it did before but we're still getting we're still getting that wonderful, wonderful roof tile happening. But if I go here, I can go to rooms and I can now come to the falconry room and I can hide that. And that takes all the props with it. So it's really going to make our, our usage a lot more efficient. The only problem is, is that it doesn't seem to match the scale of our towers. Now that irritates me quite, quite specifically because we want our, our scales to be the same. So we're going to have to come in here and uh, holding down shift and control I'm going to scale it down so it's roughly the same scale roughly the same scale as the towers if we if we so wanted to this is going to be incredibly laborious to now have to go and lay out 20 or 30 of these per room to try and get it to match so there are some other ways that we can do this we just have to be a little bit smarter about how we're working so I'm going to delete that I'm going to come to the actual room itself and go back to this floor, the actual floor covering. Now, if I change the floor covering to 50%, suddenly it's starting to get similar in scale. I'm actually going to make this, let's say, 30%. Nope, too much. So let's try 40%. Yeah, I think 40% is about, about right. I could live with, with 40% without a, 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 too much of a problem. And now we can see, okay, well, now we're starting to get a, a layering effect that we could actually take advantage of. Again, the Japanese used to have multi-layered roofs. You can see that they've done it here in this in this pre-built prop. So all we need to do is match this roof color to the roof color of the tile. And uh, that shouldn't be too difficult. So it's a little bit bluer and it's maybe a little bit darker. Just a touch, just a touch. Uh, let's bump the... Um, saturation up a little bit maybe a little bluer too blue too pink actually let's bring it back a bit too green too pink about there drop some saturation out drop it down some more too dark about right getting there starting to like it let's go to 19 there we go I think somewhere in that region there we're very very similar so now I can come in let's just double check on this prop okay 65% we can now come in and put this prop in once again we're going to shrink it down to 65% which is what the other one is now we can come in and we're getting all of the wonderful roofing detail that we wanted and we will be getting once we have suitably done this. But now we're only using four roof tiles rather than, say, eight, which is definitely better. We can line that up. There we go. And we're getting this double roofing starting to happen, which I think is absolutely fantastic. We're going to put that above the walls, just like that. And there we go. So now our room is four props, but it looks as if it's many more. It looks as if it could be more. Now, if we were really, really trying to give it a, a sense that um, there is a, a railing that runs around this roof, we could possibly do something like this where uh, we're tinting something to being that sort of very dark blue edging. And then we could make the outer wall thickness, say, one. And then you see we've got that sort of funny edge happening. I'm not particularly keen on that. You might be. So it's entirely up to you as to what you do. I'm going to stick with that for now because I think that looks quite, quite spiffy. What I do like about this, though, and about keeping these as rooms, is that when we then come to outdoors, 
when we come to placing trees and things, not tables, trees, trees, the trees are not, at the, and it doesn't matter what scale we're working at, the trees will not interfere with the building. And you might say, oh, well, I want the trees above the building. Well, okay, then we can do that. We'll just put that like that. It won't go above these props, though, because the tree in the stack um, is... This room is lower in the stack than this room, and this room's props are in the higher stack above the walls. So we could tweak that if we really, 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 really wanted to. Um, if we put the roof, the, the, the tree in the building itself, remember by clicking on that prop and making sure that it's still within the room's confines, we could do that if we so chose. I mean, that's a huge tree anyway. So as long as I leave it within the boundaries of this room, say that it's above the roof, I can make sure that it's above the roof, then we would get the effect that we wanted. The moment I drag out here and click it along to say, well, actually, it's over there, it's no longer going to be above those roofs and it will no longer actually interfere with the shape of the house. So it's entirely up to you as to, to, to how you want to, to, to hide it. Do you want it to be atmospheric? Do you want it to not be atmospheric in terms of the shape of those bits of foliage that we're now going to, to fill up the grounds with? It is important, by the way, that we do fill up the grounds. I'm just going to get these, these numbers here. Let's just make them even. I like to do that as well. 20. Let's just make it 20. Oh, and just minus 20. There we go. So it's stock standard values. Um, and it's at 40%. So I can come in and start doing all of these now. But I think that it's about the aesthetic and deciding what you want in terms of your your reveal to players. I also feel it's important to give players these little alleyways that they can hide between as they're trying to break into the castle, perhaps, or your scenario, your story. So I like to give them these little gaps and things where there isn't a little path, or there is a little path, but it's only trudged along by those going to the falconry. And why would you go to the falconry at night? I really don't know. Um, so yes, that's, that's how we're going to carry on working. I'm going to do the rest of this map now in this same style, is this roofing too boring? Do we need to change it up for other sections? The answer is an emphatic yes, we really do. Although there was a very, very high consistency in these castles because they were all built roughly at the same time. That doesn't mean that they're all going to look the same. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna tweak them. We're gonna use different roof pieces. Again, Dungeon Fog's given us this wonderful shaped piece there. We've got a long stretch, which we'll use with little red edging. We've got um, bridges, which we can still use as roofs. There's no reason why we can't. And then we've got these lovely little corner pieces that we can drop in just to give it that very, very oriental kind of feeling if we if we really wanted to do it that way. Um, so, yes, I'm going to shut up now and we're going to carry on building building rooftops. Okay, so I have finished populating this map with all the roofs that we wanted it in. I hope you uh, noticed as I fast forwarded in that that um, some of the roofs are thatch and to make more complicated thatch roofs you just make more complicated rooms. So this is actually made out of four rooms each with the thatch going in a different direction so it looks more like uh, the way that thatch would um, 
flow. So to now make this map really pop, as they say, uh, it's time for us to go in and start adding in bits and pieces that will really make this thing come to life. And I think that there are a few little things that we're going to drop in here. So we've got the lit street lamp, which I think is going to work really well. We're going to drop that all the way down to 30%. So it's really, really small. We're at 110% zoom in. So that's, this is what the players will see once we've printed it out. And the reason why I wanted to put these little um, lanterns is because they're going to really, really make things explode because they've got color, they've got lighting to them. So we're going to have to go in and change this because obviously it's really, really powerful at the moment, the lighting, that uh, the preset that's been built into this. So we're going to go in and change that, but already it's a lot more dynamic in terms of our location really really starting to come to life those shadows playing everywhere we get a sense of exactly how this little castle would work and i think the fun thing here is for us anyway is to see this and go yeah well that that kind of makes sense to put a lantern there uh this is the main gate so as you come through that gate we've got that that awful off angle which i think works quite well actually i think it, it does make it a lot more dramatic um you got this main road and probably here would be a main entrance so we're gonna have a light there as well <clears throat> keep on coming down towards the the main castle itself um i feel like this is a bit of a darkened alley but that's okay and then we'd have one there and then the castle itself would probably have one at its main entrance, which is actually in there, but we kind of don't need it because we've got that. So I'm actually going to put another one just over here, and that will fill in that gap there. I'm happy to have these darker darker areas all around because that's, that's going to be very important for our players to be able to sneak and stuff. So we've now dropped these lanterns roughly where we think they need to be. And uh, let's go in. And we're going to adjust them now. So that means bringing up the lighting bar here. See that, oh, that lovely orange glow. I think we can we can adjust that a little bit. Although maybe the orange is actually quite nice. Um, let's not screw around with that. Let's leave it as it is. So we're going to go in there. We're going to select the little light. And it's currently set to 7 foot square, which is the default standard. We're going to drop that down. Let's make that 2 feet. And let's have a look and see what that's going to do. So we're going to go make each one of these just around two feet, somewhere around there. And so what that means is it's going to shine very brightly for for a two foot ra two square radius, basically. You've got to press uh, two and you've got to press enter to actually make it engage. That is turning it down. It's definitely turning it down. So it's we're getting we're getting these shadows are being drawn a little bit longer, a little bit darker, a little bit dimmer. There is still another trick that we have to do here and that will really make it explode in terms of the lighting and not there yet so we're just going to drop this down see what we think we can always go lower we can always come back and drop it down a little bit lower lots of light here at the back which we might need to actually reduce um so let's zoom out and see what we think of that that actually doesn't look too unnatural to me. Oh, we need a little lantern in there. Of course, the courtyard uh, needs to be illuminated. And outside the courtyard needs to be illuminated as well. What am I thinking? Um, so these were... Oops, I'm holding the wrong wrong thing down. I need to hold down Control shift to squeak it down there. Okay, so we're going to come in over here. And there'll be a little lamp, I'm sure, in here to illuminate there. I'm going to drop one out here. It's going to do something weird because there's no there's no floor there. So at the moment, it's not sure what it's illuminating. And we're going to come in here and drop one in here. We will have a floor in there shortly. But for now, let's just do that. And let's drop these. Oh, I'm going to have to go into content. Uh, content here and go street lamp. Uh, street lamp, street lamp, street lamp. It's okay. I'm just double checking that they all are on two. Okay, that's fine. They are. Come in here, select this one. I know that's not on two. Change that to two. I'm out here, change that to two. And now I can select this other one, which I know is still at seven. Okay, there we go. So let's put those out there. Um, I haven't built the bridge across, actually. So if I go back to my original stage and I turn the lighting effect off, now you go back to show blueprint. There should be a little bridge going across there. So 
Let's drop that in there now quickly whilst we are here. And I like to use this bridge because it scales down quite dramatically. It makes it look quite nice, I think. It kind of fits with the um, theme. And if we do four of them, let me just rotate it around to the opposite angle. And we line them up like that. And then we turn the shadows off for the top top layer of bridges it then all blends together and it doesn't look doesn't look so strange so we're going to have those bridges then we're going to have uh, land drawn off down here which i suppose for the purposes of this demonstration we should actually do that now so i'm going to come in here and just roughly again i'm holding down shift i'm just roughly going to block out this this territory down here because it's not it's not hugely important for us in terms of the map design so I'm not too worried about it we can actually you know what we're gonna cut off that so that our players can get a true sense of what's going on okay and up there have we got any legal connection I think we do okay so what we're going to have to do uh, we actually can't get through there that's a that's a pain that's a definite pain if we go there and we zoom in do we really hit the side really really we can't cross over nope all right we're gonna have to abandon the ship and start again happens well, maybe we should be intelligent about it. What did I do here? I've zoomed in on Chrome, not on the map. That explains things. Turn the layer off. All right, let's make this um, dirt so we know that it's it's castle dirt. Make that 70%, for example. And come out here again. And we're going to stay zoomed in so that we don't do the same mistake. I'm going roughly here because I'm going to show you what we're going to do in terms of making this feel more like terrain I'm not going to follow the exact course because that I don't think is the purpose of the video I'm going to actually close off that moat learning from last time let's come across here and now we can close off and come down here now if you're wondering why I'm using rooms and not shapes it's because rooms give us the ability to to zero the thickness and then we can use brushes on top of them that's a real real benefit so let's hide this blueprint again we can see that this lantern is still sitting in this no man's land in this strange strange sort of space we're gonna to get to that this needs to be, I feel, a lot darker in terms of what it represents, which is no man's land, quite, 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 quite literally. Okay, so that's fine. So these lanterns have now gone in. We can then go in and we can we can decorate with. Um, I noticed that there was a well, but I also noticed, or I know, for example, that in one of the expansions, and again, you will have to have a subscription or have purchased a license yes there are some colored booths which could look quite quite decorative whether you think these look oriental and fit our theme or not I don't know but I thought that if we did that with a rotation on this side it would sort of look it would look I think anyway quite festive uh, is it that one? No, it's that one. There we go. Now the stripes match. It could look quite festive and it'll help break up this monotonous sort of space and it allows us to see that we could sit there under benches and that sort of thing. Um, so there's that. We could put in the other colours if we really wanted to. And then I noticed that there was a fountain. Now the fountain is very, very big, but once we've scaled it down, it could actually sit quite nicely round about there as this water feature or here in front of the castle i'm going to actually put it here uh, because this is sort of our, our garden of of unearthly delights if you like or it will be let's shrink that down a little bit 
Um, so there we go. We've got a little fountain in there. And again, if we wanted to, we could go to, um, where is it? Um, gone blank now, vehicles. And I think in vehicles, they've got little carts, which again, once we've scaled them down, could be left in strategic places just to, to build a little bit of flavor and, and make the place feel like it's lived in. Um, there are these coaches, which could be rickshaws, very oriental in terms of flavoring. Um, but then again, of course, we can always just go to other... other um, sets we must always remember and i'm i'm not very good at this is to remember that there are many options for us in terms of of wagons and carts and and the like to help decorate these these spaces so if i actually put the wagon here like that we get quite a little festive thing happening there which i think works quite well uh street signs they they didn't have they still don't have street names to this day as a matter of fact so that's happening there. Battleground, I think there was a cart, but I think it was full of bodies. So we don't necessarily want to use that. Toppled towers, broken catapults. No, we don't want to do that sort of thing. So anyway, now it's a case of just going in and decorating as you so choose. If you really wanted to, to put in a sewer or something, you could put in a little a little sewage grate if you so if you so chose. If you wanted to sort of give the players a hint that um there are drains and and the like you can choose the one that you think fits the style the best these castles didn't really have that kind of drainage to be perfectly perfectly honest with you but there we go it is something that we can look at the far east if we go um they've got some nice statues which we can drop in and that will really really clinch the deal i think anyway in terms of making this space feel very very oriental um it's just about where do we put the giant statue of the dragon. It could be there as you're coming in, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, your main path coming in is a bit blocked by this building, to be perfectly honest with you. Maybe we put it here in front of the castle as like a, a guardian statue. Something like that, maybe. Or maybe it's on the side here. Um, sort of tucked in there, just ready to leap out and protect whoever comes in i'm not sure we'll we can think about that if we uh, are so inclined we can we can put in little bridges and and now we could go in and put in um flags to to denote things buildings might have a flag in front of them um nearby if we really wanted this to be a street scene we could do more of that um so yeah it's really about just just having fun now and and populating what I think is quite a, a dramatic map to begin with. And I think now with the lighting has been made even more so. Uh, if we wanted, we could put a little curved bridge in here. Maybe we want a little stream to a pool. Uh, if we really wanted to, a sort of a Japanese style garden. Um, so it is, it is now over to you in terms of what you want to add in. I put a little chimney on there, so maybe we should have some smoke coming out of that. They've got some oriental type trees, which are quite dramatic. They're quite quite pretty in their in their coloration. Um, oh, I can see that that roof was actually outside the building, which is fine. We were talking earlier about making sure that there are, although there is 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 guard patrols and 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 that sort of thing, and that they. They shouldn't be completely ineffective. We should also be cognizant of the fact that our players do need to sneak around, possibly in this castle. Possibly they need to sneak in and 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 you know claim claim something or rescue someone or um, something along those lines. Anyway, and so we should try and help them out when we can by creating these little not blind spots, but little areas that they could arguably escape into if they're being chased and so then you know maybe it was the wind i don't know and then they you know the, the chasers wander off um i i'm a firm believer in doing that for my players is is giving them the opportunity to get in muck it up and then to have an escape route that actually allows them to escape rather than 
putting them under under more pressure or, or, or denying them that opportunity because I don't I don't see the point in 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 creating something that oh my players will never escape from this mwahaha well that might be fun for for some player groups but um, I think it can be frustrating it's also about knowing what your players are all about and, and what they like and, and don't like now there's one last thing that we need to do here well obviously we've got this roof that's being covered which is not so nice so let's go to that layer these tree bushes um, need to go all the way down and again, if I was really, really, really um, conscientious, I could um, which one did I get there now? If I was really conscientious, I could group everything, and then that will make everything a lot easier to manage. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. For the, I, I started off with good intentions, but that's usually where they end. So yeah, we can go in. We can put some more trees in if we if we wanted to. What I do want to do though is fill up this water. And I'm going to show you how we're going to do that now so that it's quite dramatic. I think, anyway, it's it's the technique that I always use for, for water creation. And um, so I'm going to go here. And I'm going to create this shape. Now, I am going to create a shape. It doesn't have to have a shadow at all. We're going to use a water texture. Um, let's find water. There it is there. And we're not going to use sea ground. We are going to use actual water. Let's go with a nice bright... A nice bright color and let's make it say a hundred percent so we've got we can see it I'm gonna zoom out because what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna make we're gonna make a complete shape here because we have no reason not to okay now it's in the wrong it's in the right it's in this building if that makes sense we're gonna drag it out of that building and then like I said keep your cursor inside so now we've got this water layer, and what I like about the shapes is that we can change the opacity. So we're going to drop the opacity. Oh, let's probably drop it down to about 32 or 20, 20%, 20 25%, somewhere around there. Doesn't doesn't particularly matter. And the reason for that is because we're going to go here, and we're going to create another level now, this bottom level. So we've got this one, which is called the ground floor. Let's call that the ground floor. Then this we're going to call the waterbed. Now the waterbed at the moment has got the straight stage color, and here we can come in and we can say, okay, well let's use, let's use the sea ground, the sea bed, if you like, and let's make it that sort of color, or maybe this one's better, maybe that one's a bit better, and let's say that that's three, not three thousand percent, three hundred percent, and rotate it say fifty-five degrees, so it's not so repeated not convinced that that's the right way to go actually let's have a look and see what else we've got that looks like constructed tiles uh, a little bit of sea grass well why not why not then what we do is <clears throat> to to really bring it to life i think anyway is let's throw in a dead tree i'll we'll just throw in a dead tree there um let's go to the not the far east let's go to the desert and grab ourselves a mammoth bone and drop that there and mammoth skull is a little bit too obvious perhaps we can go to the laboratory if we want another animal skull that we could just sort of drop in maybe there-ish and then of course the pirates will give us the fish that we desperately desperately want wonderful wonderful fish so very japanese if we make them orange so let's do exactly that so we'll put those there and we'll get the circular ones that are swimming in a circle over here. Nice big fish. And then let's change them. We're going to colorize them and we're going to make them orange. So they look more like koi. Okay, that's brilliant. That's great. And then we come up here and suddenly our seabed is filled with this mysterious stuff which we can just make out. Again, we can play around with this layering so we can make it darker or, or thinner but that's not yet we're not yet finished so we wanted it to have a slight double layering if you like that seagrass underneath is really not doing it for me i think it's too big um so let's make it 80 percent that might not work either let's just try some regular darkened soil something like that might work to help make the fish pop out could work we'll we'll, we'll play around with a little bit and then our last little prop that I like to use is then in Pirates, you've got this wave 
it's called uh, what's it called um, it's just a white block high sea waves now these are at 100% I'm actually going to open them up and put them at say two let's say 300% so I can drop these down now it looks like the ocean or it looks like the moat I should say is going absolutely ballistic which is fine for now we're going to come back to it and the trick with water is that it's always about layering it's always about making it look as if it's if it's got depth to it which of course in this kind of map it certainly doesn't we're going to change that uh, by doing this little trick which now I've been to this castle and this is a very shallow moat but it wasn't that shallow uh, all the time it was deeper uh, during wartime obviously and so we are just going to fill it in with our imaginations a little bit we'll work on the layering those mammoth bones are already starting to look quite good okay so now we've done that something that people often forget is that we should change the opacity so we again change the opacity to about 45 percent but here we actually keep it random so we sort of just ran just click through just drop it down don't don't be too too precise in what you're doing um get it just just knock it down and the effect is that you're going to have areas of calm where you can barely see the effect and areas where the effects overlapping and that's actually going to create more ripples more waves and so i'm hoping that you can you can see that on the video we're going to have to sort that little bridge out because the bridge has got lost but this allows us to create a very nice water effect where we've got a sense of depth, sense, sense of seeing through to what's below. And we could then carry on layering. I mean, we could put in little waves and, and really go to town. Um, <clears throat> if we really wanted to, we could come in here. Where are we now? There's our water level. Again, we can play around with the opacity. So that's a, a darkish moat. There's It's too bright there, obviously. So we want to play around somewhere in that region. Let's say make this 500%. Maybe that works for us. Maybe it shouldn't be so blue. Maybe we can knock out some of that blueness. Uh, maybe we want a more green lake. Something along those lines, perhaps. Maybe we want it to be more like the color it actually is, which is a, a sort of a brownish color. Well, no, we would just colorize it. Just colorize it. Um, it's more of a dark, muddy brown. If we really wanted it to be sort of the color that it currently is, which is that color, I don't know. Does that look better or worse? I think it looks worse personally. So let's just turn it back to to what it should be. I'm not unhappy with that. I must admit, not unhappy with that. We've just got to move our bridge. <laughs> um, so I am actually going to make a new folder and call it Bridge. And I'm going to drag Bridge all the way down to my actual bridge and then put in order this is the key in the same order by dragging and dropping the bridge so we can then take the bridge actually you know what while we're here while we're here while we're here nobody knows about this little bridge so let's put that little bridge in there as well and then we can take them all up 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 come on and then that's above the above the water so we get that nice effect we can we can play around with that even more we can put some more trees in i think we need it i think we need a variety of trees as well and we've certainly got that um yeah i think these fir trees might work so we can come in there and then realize of course that um not all buildings are created equal some are layered lower than others and we must just come in and correct that. We want this to feel as if it's integrated. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's get into this. Oh, now, something that we will have a problem is, is that our water level, because it's so big, will now dominate the map. So we've got to just lock it, and then you can select um, back to, to normal sort of structures and things. Okay, so I think, again, what makes sense in this instance is we're going to make another folder. We're going to call it trees. And we want the trees to always be below the roof. Below the roof. 
Uh, where's my trees gone? We want them to be below the roofs because the, the map was designed to show us the um, buildings, not the tree line. I think that makes sense in my brain anyway. And then I can take this all the way down and just dump it just above towers so that my roofs... Where are you now? Did I forget to put you in? Yes, I forgot to put you in the folder. It happens. I think it looks nicer with the trees underneath the roof as well anyway. That's my personal opinion. Okay, so that's fine. So we're in this tree layer, so it should stay uh, plopping these down in that space, hopefully. And we just want a variety. I don't think they'd have a tree stump. I mean, that's... How old is this castle? I don't think they would have tree stumps, to be honest with you. If we really want to get fancy, we can turn these shrubs into... Uh, we can we can give them shadows, so then they they have shadows and things. Uh, if if we really wanted to, but I'm not convinced we we do. Again, playing with scale is important. So some big bushes, some little bushes, and there's so many different trees and things that you've got to choose from that I really don't think you'll be hard pressed to ever uh, foliate your map. To, to use an awful term, but there we go. I don't think you'll ever ever struggle. Uh, maybe our fountain down here needs a little a little something, and then let's put a tree there and another tree over there, for example, just because we can make our little. Our little castle seem a little bit more welcoming if we really wanted to. Um, they made some lovely little decorative trees. Maybe drop one in there. And that's it. That is how we make this very interesting map. If we really wanted to play around with it, by the way, if we want to make these lights pop and to make it feel more like it's day night time. So we lower the stage lights. And that, that darkens out the stage a little bit, making the map really jump out. And then we lower the room light. And as you can see, immediately the effect is to, to see those glowing lights. But we can come back and uh, maybe put it somewhere around about, let's see, there-ish. So we can really see those lights. The room light, again, we can drop all the way down if we really wanted to. But we don't want it to go too far. We just want to get that, that separation happening. And... Maybe the grid is too bright still. So we can always come in and change that. Or we can change it to black. Just make it black. That's that's personal preference. And if we wanted this water to feel like it's alive, we go into the water layer. It's the last tip before I leave you. And select from flavor. Go down to fire. And select blue fly fire. Just drop that around. Then select the actual fireballs and neutralize their color. Make them invisible. And then when you go back up onto the ground, you get these little wells of light. There's not a huge difference, but it is there. Trust me, it is there. Um, if we want, we can go back to this layer. Now the lighting is separate per layer. So if we want the stage to be darker, we can do that. And then you'll probably see a bit more of a dramatic change here. There we go. You can see those little lights happening. And so that's it. That's how we create Matsumoto Castle. I hope that you have found this tutorial enlightening, inspiring perhaps. You'll be able to grab this map off of um, our Dungeon Fog account. We're going to free this up and let anybody have access to it. Because it's always nice to have a castle that you can use. And uh, if you're looking for more maps, join our Patreon, where you get a map this month that has to do with our glass dragon, the creature that we created specifically for our uh, 
live show, as a matter of fact, for one of our uh, episodes called A Glass Dragon. Let's go and look out for that. Until next week, I wish you and yours the very happiest of campaign creation.